Hello, hello. This is Scott Wade, Study Travel TV producer, and today I'm talking to Brett Blacker, CEO of English Australia, the Language School Association with 126 members. And we're going to be chatting about the EA stats for 2020 that were made public last week. G'day, Brett. How's it going, mate? Hi, Scott. Doing well, thanks. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you too. So as far as the uh, EA 2020 stats go, we have to see them as a good result, mate, as the numbers only dropped 47%, which is a lot less than the 75 to 80% we're hearing from Ireland and Malta and the likes of the UK and the USA. Now, given Australia is pretty much totally locked out international arrivals, even Australians trying to get home, how have you managed that? Yes, yeah, Scott, good point. We, um, the first few months of 2020 were still actually tracking relatively well. And um, there's probably two key points. Uh, the student visa data, which is, is mostly reported in terms of our, our overall stats and, and, and the, the bulk of our, our student numbers in, in that last 2020 cohort, 74% of the students were here on student visas. Um, but it, it's a mixed uh, performance between colleges that teach those students on student visas and those that um, would have been on visitor or working holidays, which actually had more of the 60 to 70% um, market decline. But what we saw was trends. So the overall market, as you mentioned, down um, 47%. But if you actually look even on the student visa proportion, um, in October last year, the decline was almost 60%. Um, in November, it was 63%. And in December, it was 76%. So it, it sort of tailed off very hard um, from where we were at the start to um, the, the back half of the year. Right. And there was a fair few online students in that cohort as well, weren't there? Yeah, it was actually really interesting. Um, in 2020, we, English Australia, were supported by Department of Education, Skills, Employment here in Australia to do uh, a new research piece each quarter, um, which looked at the, the volume of students that were either studying on student visa, um, non-student visa, but also if they were online offshore. Um, and it's the first time we'd, we'd uh, captured that data set. And the trends were, were really quite remarkable from the first quarter, which is obviously only when the, the border, hard border closures first started, where there was just 1% of the total cohort studying online or offshore, track that through to Q4. Uh, and in, in that period from October, November, December, half the reported students in that survey were studying online and um, with a, a strong proportion over of those that were actually offshore. So yeah, in terms of innovation and, and the, the ability for, student um, providers to pick up students in, in an online offshore market. Um, quite a remarkable achievement, really. Yeah, it was a great result, mate. Now, in the stats, there's an obvious dichotomy in the markets, those that decreased 50% and more, and those that decreased between 13 and 25%, such as Nepal and Colombia. And how did they manage to keep their numbers so high? Yeah, with the, the border closures, uh, the, I mentioned the students that had arrived in Australia pre the, the formal closure on the 19th of March in 2020. And those, those cohort students in particular, Colombia, Nepal, were two that we'd had higher numbers of students actually arrive. And um, many of the students that were here on shore um, continued to study throughout the year. Um, over that period and, and progressed their English language throughout the year. So they, we didn't see as dramatic market decline because they weren't necessarily able to travel into Australia. Um, it was a little bit more stable, mainly because of them actually being in Australia before the borders uh, had formally closed. So when they re-enroll in an English program then, if that's what they did, are they counted as a new student that, um, rather than the same student who is doing more weeks? It depends on your, the, the, the way in which um, the data is counted. So Department of Education uh, in their student visa statistics will only count them as a commencement once and, and an enrolment um, during that period of time. Um, for us here, we'd actually seen growth. So our, our survey data counts the student as just one person. Um, so they'll only ever be counted once in that data set. 
Um, the student weeks obviously will um, increase with them being on shore, but we, we'd seen growth out of um, particularly Columbia in, in terms of it, its market share out of 2019 into 2020, um, with it becoming our number two top source destination, even in, in our student visa cohort. Um, and in Brazil at that stage was number three. So it, at the end of um, 2019, December 2019 into December 2020, we'd actually had almost you know, equivalent numbers, almost market share equivalent out of Colombia and Brazil as we'd had out of China at the end of 2019. So we, we were on a, a very much on a, a growth trajectory um, out of Latin America um, pre the border closures and, and that's what shielded a bit. Okay, so that's quite interesting. So Colombia, is it fair to say then that uh, EEA colleges have developed excellent agent school relations over there? Oh, critical. Um, you know, as, as I think we're both well aware, um, Scott, the, the market out of Latin America is, is largely supported through those agent networks. And um, we've sort of had initially Brazil, um, we'd had very good market traction working with the agent networks out of Brazil. But over time, particularly in 2018, 19, the, the trend had started to shift with, with larger numbers coming from Colombia. And we'd even seen diversification across the states where initially many of those students were either studying down on, on the east coast from Queensland, um, New South Wales or Victoria. Um, in, into the 2020 data, we had really strong um, student numbers going over into Perth in Western Australia and also into Adelaide. And so we'd, we'd sort of had enough market penetration and, and working with agents that were supporting students actually to study in many destinations around, around Australia at that time. Well, that's good news. And there's uh, an excellent uh, agency association up there in Colombia too. Now you explained that, <clears throat> it's a bit of a geeky question, I suppose, but you explained that uh, if an English language school is teaching students that go on to uni, and in your presentation you said this, even if they are a standalone Ellicott College, they are counted as a university provider type. So. Do these colleges have to be teaching 100% uni students to be classified as a, this uni provider type, or is there a threshold um, for the stats purposes? Yeah, great question, Scott. So in the webinar that we presented on the 2020 annual Ellicross Market Survey last week in, in partnership with Bonnard, the, the data that's reported generally on, a, on an aggregate level, um, looking at both student numbers and student weeks, um, some years ago, we introduced the new field around provider categorization. Um, so it's unique to this survey and the, the rationale behind adding the provider categorization was when we looked at the market and it would suggest that you know, at the time, 20 odd percent of the students were coming from China. Um, that wasn't standing true if you're a university based provider whereby 50, 60%, um, perhaps even more of your student market was coming through from China, or you're a standalone Ellicott only provider who may have only had two or 3%. So adding the provider categorizations enabled us to then give much greater visibility in terms of trends in, in market type by nationality into different um, colleges. And so we, we traditionally seen many of the university based providers, and they could be privately owned, but would predominantly be teaching students that were coming on English for academic purpose courses into university-based programs. Uh, it's really strong markets, obviously out of China, um, quite strong markets in, in those ones out of, sort of the Japan study tours, um, traditionally as well in terms of the Indian student cohorts going through, um, many of the Thai students and, and um, others that were coming particularly for universities. When we looked at the, the standalone Ellicott private providers or the VET-based providers, where the Latin Americans and the Brazilians and the Colombians, Japanese students, again, um, on working holiday and, and visitor visas, South Koreans in similar mix, they were very two or two or three um, distinct cohorts of arriving students, which were depending on the provider type. So, we ask that a, when a provider is responding to the survey that they distinguish whether that primary 
sort of cohort or, or primary um, um, courses that they'd be teaching the students to would either be represented by English only standalone, English into vet based courses, uh, vocational education courses, or English into um, higher education and university courses. Right, yeah. Now, uh, moving on to a bit of political shenanigans, the Australian Federal Government announced last week that international <clears throat> student arrivals would be phased back until a yet to be quantified level of vaccinations has been achieved in the Australian population. And we were chatting about this before we started doing this broadcast, Brett, and how the UK has achieved somewhere in the 80s, 80% uh, uh, levels of vaccinations in their population for, uh, um, for the for the non-juniors anyway. So given the ultra slow rollout of vaccinations in Australia, would you agree that this point um, that uh, of the vaccination levels being at a sufficient level, which we don't know yet, is at least a year away. And so Australia will miss another January, February intake. Yes, yeah, Scott, there's, there's certainly a, a lot of work being undertaken by different states and territories around returning students. Um, to date, most of those have relied on a, a program very similar to our, our domestic arrivals through a quarantining process. And that in itself, um, as you've experienced, uh, requires 14 day hotel isolation um, on arrival. As a model in itself, it was never really um, going to provide large numbers of students to, to come back and, and English Australia is pushing and advocating for, for many different options to be explored um, with managed travel um, as one of those uh, as an alternative. Um, the reports to date are programs that states and territories are working on around bringing the cohorts back into Australia um, will still remain in process. The state and territories had to uh, create arrival plans which were above or outside the caps and the limitations which were put on the domestic arrivals or Australian citizen arrivals. So the reduction in, in total arrival numbers for the time being shouldn't disrupt those planning processes, albeit they are relatively small numbers um, in terms of the, the initial pilot programs and largely focused on returning higher education uh, and research higher degree students who have been displaced and aren't able to, to complete their course. Yeah. Um, they they would have to a be a priority. That's right, mm -hmm. they are. Um, so I guess in many ways, the, the arrival plans to date haven't been seen as a, I guess a silver bullet for recovery. Uh, I think to, to your point, uh, a 12 month process from here to now where vaccination levels are much higher is, is I suspect where a lot of providers are sort of planning uh, at the moment. We have had support from the federal government in terms of an innovation program, an innovation grants program. And so again, hoping that there may be opportunities for providers to try and continue to grow that online offshore cohort, at least in the short term, uh, and, and see how that could be leveraged now more in, over the next 12 months as well. Yeah, um, are we talk, we're talking about English language here though, um, aren't we? as far as that goes so and so are you are you saying that the, the numbers that the Aussie government announced last week um, for international passenger arrivals that, that are being halved from 6,000 to 3,000 per week to take the pressure off the quarantine system in the light of the arrival of the delta strain here um, I mean yes. are you saying that the, that, that that tiny number of 3,000 or even 6,000 is still quite a small number is a separate number from the cohorts which for international students? Yeah, correct. It is. So okay. the yeah, the the none of the so none of the state and territories were able to include international student arrivals within those state cohorts. Mm -hmm. So all of the planning process and logistics around bringing the student um, back into Australia needed to be independent of those systems. Um, they might leverage similar systems, um, be it through a hotel quarantine uh, or purpose-built student um, accommodation, which has the same levels of protocols, um, same security type arrangements, uh, has to be signed off by the chief health officer or chief medical officer in that state and territory, uh, has to be supported by uh, security equivalent to what the state security levels would be. 
um, state government. And um, so all of the protocols around the returning plans had to match and mirror requirements that the state or territory would have, but needed to operate independently and be costed independently on a user pay service um, outside of, of the, the standard quarantining arrangements for a, an, an Australian citizen returning. Right. And so, um, and would you say a uh, job keeper has come to an end here in Australia now, hasn't it? Um, it I mean, has, I, yeah. Uh, were the schools relying on that quite a lot um, to over the last uh, 16 or 17 months or so? And with that at an end, uh, is, uh, are the chances of still being here in a year's time still quite good? So, yeah, the JobKeeper program and, and other federal government stimulus um, through rent moratoriums or, or pass, um, uh, tax, tax rebates definitely were a lifeline for the private um, segment of, of English language providers here in Australia. And I mean, probably testified by the fact that there's only been around six, six to seven uh, provider closures since the border actually had a hard, hard stop. And, and if you were to consider that normally the, the duration of the average student um, is around 13 weeks, um, of, of study is the, the, the historical standard to, to be considering that we're 16 months on from, from a border closure and we still have only had half a dozen provider closures. It, it's quite outstanding. Now, that's not to say that there hasn't been an enormous amount of business impact, um, huge levels of job losses. And, and whilst the JobKeeper program sustained many of the private uh, Ellicost providers and, and teachers that enable them to innovate and you know, do other um, creative things over that period. Many of the, the job losses were actually felt within the, those university-based centres and, and many providers which weren't, weren't initially eligible for the employment assistance. So we kind of had a period where job losses um, vastly occurred within university-based uh, English language providers. Now, um, post the, the JobKeeper program um, support mechanism, we've seen our independent sector just getting leaner and leaner in, in terms of their operating structures. And um, it, it's a huge risk moving forward in terms of whilst employment levels um, are actually relatively okay here in Australia, um, you know, sort of vastly similar to pre-pandemic levels at the moment, the, the, the number of job losses that we've seen, you know, 70 to 80 percent of people within English language colleges having some impact over the last year and being either losing their jobs, being required to take less hours, you know, changing the nature of their role. Uh, we'll have a better insight in the coming weeks on what that looks like in 2021 and, and what impact the, the reduction of, of JobKeeper has had in, in job losses. Um, once we have a look at the Q1 data. Well, given, um, given that the uh, employment statistics are actually so good, and in fact, Australia's economic um, results have been very good um, after an initial dip at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, if, if there have been job losses from the schools, they've probably found alternative employment and maybe a bit hard to get back. Uh, that, that's absolutely the risk that I think is, is one that um, we're facing at the moment. You know, the, those qualified, experienced teachers that uh, have, have been really the, the lifeblood of, of the sector, um, you know, we, we, we do stand at risk that some of those won't return. Indeed, if it's another you know, six to 12 months before we start to see a normalisation in, in student numbers. As I mentioned, we, we, we have had some additional support from the federal government, which was a program announced in, in our latest federal budget and, and it's something that English Australia had lobbied for consecutively in, in the months leading up to the budget. And, and that's some funding for the innovation fund or innovation um, funding grants, which can provide up to $150,000 for private uh, early cost providers or, or private higher education providers to look at how they can adapt their business models and, and try and develop more online um, offshore programs 
And within those, that um, program itself, we, you know, we're certainly very hopeful that it will enable colleges to retain some, some staff that can work on these projects. Um, and, and to be able to build new business models and, and, and hopefully that will sustain some of the colleges. In so that's, things that, that, so that's a government project aimed spe specifically at EA type colleges teaching Ellicos. Absolutely. Well, that's yeah. a good result. Fact, uh, that's a good result. So well done. I gather you would have had a fair bit to do in achieving that result there, Brett. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, we are absolutely very proud of the outcome uh, you, in, in the budget itself. So it was a $9 million budget allocation towards the sector. Uh, you know, we, we obviously think that we, the sector needs more and we'd love to see more being split between all of our, our, our different college types. But uh, you know, working with many of the, the private providers who, whose livelihoods and, and businesses you know, really really will be supported by this program over the coming months then uh, yeah we, we are very very proud of the achievement as, as English Australia. Absolutely so now in your stats Queensland had the biggest drop so do you think state politics play a part in these numbers and are there any state premiers that you'd highlight for their progressive international student policies? Uh, the, the dropout of Queensland was mainly because of the the, the reliance on uh, non-student visa holders and in the, the data that we, we reported uh, for the annual ELICOS survey, you, you note that you know, we saw 47% decline in, in the total student numbers, but when you looked at the breakdown by visa types, there was actually a much bigger decrease uh, in the non-student visa type, the working holiday and visitor visa. And so Queensland had traditionally had around half of its student market had actually been from non-student visa holders. And it sometimes a little bit distorts the, the data. But if you consider at the end of 2020, Australia declined 47% in total. The student visas went down by 43%. Visitor visas went down 68% and working holidays went down 61%. So Queensland was proportionally impacted more because of the volume of students that would normally be in Queensland on those other visa types. Um, I guess in terms of progressiveness, uh, I, you know, I think there are, this period of time has shown our, our state and territory governments all have a, a strong awareness of the value, uh, both economic and social and cultural, for students in their states. You know, to date, the South Australian Premier, the New South Wales Premier, and, and indeed the, the Victorian Premier have each come out and, and are pushing plans with the federal government. Um, we had our Northern Territory government had its first, first and only pilot uh, into Australia so far was a, you know, a small cohort that went through the Northern Territory government. Um, so I, I think there is certainly appetite and support across most, if not all, of the states and territories. But unfortunately, at the moment, it, it, we're sort of fragmented in, in the way in which we're approaching it um, in, in, in different cohorts by different states. And, and that does add a, a, another complexity to, 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 I guess, the end game of, of bringing back students to, um, to all parts of Australia. Yeah, it does. And uh, for those of you out there aren't aware of Australian politics, um, the federal government has devolved, in essence, quite a few of the uh, travel and COVID related decisions to this to all of the states. And so they're all they're all have their own ideas, um, some completely at one end of the scale, virtually from from the other. Um, on how to handle the, uh, the travel situation. He, and, at, with, and at the moment, the travel situation is really just almost between the states. There's very few international travellers at all coming into Australia, and they're all going straight into two weeks quarantine. Correct, yeah. yeah. Which has, in, in, uh, today, to, uh, even to travel from one state to another state could require that you're going into quarantine when you arrive in that state as well, if, you, if you're coming from what's declared as a the COVID hotspot um, by, by any of the other state jurisdictions. So there, there is certainly a complexity. I think that um, it's highlighted some of the, yeah, 
the issues that we have in, in terms of working with, with both um, multiple levels of, of government at the same time. I don't think it, it necessarily means a lack of commitment across any party, but it, it just adds to the, the complexity. Yeah, it sure does. All right, Brett, thanks for your time today. Um, we're going to talk to you again in a couple of weeks' time when you have the first quarter figures ready for 2021 for the EA schools. So yep. uh, until then, um, love your beard, mate. Keep, keep growing it. And I'll see you in a couple <laughs> of weeks. Thanks, Scott. Look forward to it, mate. Take care. See you later, Brett.